Welcome to the Bioengineering Distinguished Seminar Series. Uh, today we are fortunate to have Dr. Susan Harkima uh, to present our uh, Distinguished Seminar. Dr. Harkima is a Professor and Associate Scientific Director for the University of Louisville Kentucky Spinal Cord Injury Research Center. She is also the Director at the Frazier Rehab Institute and a Director of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation's Neuro Recovery Network. Uh, Dr. Harkima completed her bachelor's and doctoral work at the Michigan State University and did her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, she is a world-renowned expert in elucidating fundamental mechanisms that control human locomotion. Thank you. Well, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and um, I am a notorious to try to cram about 23 years of work in one hour, so I'm just going to get right uh, to my talk uh, today. Uh, and um, but I do try to start out thanking uh, those who um, support uh, support us right up front because I end up not usually uh, being able to do things at the end. So you'll see those who contribute to this work as we go along, and I do want to just uh, put up here our funders uh, here at the front. Um, what you're going to see is, uh, what I'm starting up here, is four individuals who uh, uh, volunteered a significant uh, amount of their lives and time for the discoveries that I'm going to talk about uh, today. These are four young men who were diagnosed with a complete uh, spinal cord injury uh, who we have learned some really critical discoveries that have launched um, uh, new insights and new knowledge and uh, I think we are finding um, it's going to open up new treatments for people with paralysis and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And one of the things, uh, and, it, it, and what you're going to also find out is that we've had great partnerships with the Speed School uh, that's led to a lot of patents that I'm going to share with you at the end. And so we are really appreciative of our partnerships here with the, the Speed School. Uh, and we would not uh, have the successes that we have had uh, without those partnerships. Um, so a colleague of mine um, uh, named these guys the Fantastic Four. And so uh, uh, he gave me permission to steal that, and, I, and, and they really truly are. Um, so uh, activity-based therapy um, is based on neurophysiological principles of activity-dependent plasticity. And so what I kind of want to interleave in here is what we do with our partnership with Fraser Rehab Institute is to translate hard core scientific principles into evidence-based therapy. So I'm going to be interleaving sort of our, our mission, which is translating basic scientific evidence, also reaching out uh, to technological advances, and interleaving all of those things into uh, creating therapeutic interventions. So activity-based therapy is based on activity-dependent plasticity, which is defined as changes in the nervous and or muscular system that are driven by repetitive activity. So neuromuscular acti activation below the level of lesion. So this is really critical because from a therapeutic standpoint, most therapies are really focused on above the lesion. So someone has a spinal cord injury, they assess that, they look at that, and they say, okay, these are your deficits, we're going to look at you for about a year, then we're going to find ways to compensate, we're going to strengthen, we're going to design technology to compensate, to, to work at what your deficits are. What we do, and, and not that those things aren't important, they are critically important, and there's places around the world that do that really well. That's not what we do. We focus on below the injury. So we look at neuromuscular activation below the level of lesion. And focus on that. And there's ways to activate the nervous system below the injury level. You can do it intrinsically or you can do it extrinsically. And the way that you do that intrinsically, one way you do that is locomotor training. Locomotor training, and this is where my career started. Locomotor training is built on the concept 
of driving a set of circuitry within the spinal cord called central pattern generation with proprioception. And you drive that circuitry with information about walking, about locomotion, you drive it over and over again, and there's infrastructure in the spinal cord that you are born with that knows how to locomote, and you can drive it over and over again, and you can generate locomotion. And it's been known since the 1970s that all species, other than humans, okay, it's well known that that structure exists. And what I did with my career is to try to understand whether that circuitry existed in humans. So that's where I started in the early 90s. So that's locomotor training, driving activity dependent plasticity with proprioception. Now the, so you can do that. Now the other way to drive activity below an injury level is extrinsically. And you can do that with electrical stimulation. You can do it with epidural stimulation. And you can also do it with neuromuscular electrical stimulation. So you can do it by putting electrodes on the muscles. You can stimulate the muscles. <coughs> then you can send signals back into the spinal cord, into the circuitry, and you can stimulate that spinal cord circuitry that way. So even though you're directly stimulating the circuitry, it's going back to the spinal cord. <coughs> now, task-specific training is an important component of this from a therapeutic standpoint, and it's executing the movement over and over again and retraining the circuitry. So this is taking scientific principles and applying them to a therapeutic, uh, and integrating it into a therapeutic idea, okay? So this is an overview of that. Now, I mentioned these, the circuitry in the spinal cord called central pattern generators. The, this is in the circuitry. Now, in a human, the idea, in a human, all of you have heard, even engineers have heard of a reflex, right? You know what a reflex is, right? You go to the doctor, they do this, you go like that, everybody knows what that is, okay? That's a reflex, okay? Your nervous system is not that simple, okay? I want you to not think about that ever again, okay? Your nervous system is not that simple. You see this? This is one neuron. That is one tiny neuron. You have millions of those in your nervous system millions of those. They are connected in millions of different ways. There's a complex circuitry in your spinal cord and there are on one single neuron there are million there are contacts and all of those contacts have the ability to change and influence how your nervous system changes. Okay, so when we think about epidural stimulation and, what, and I haven't really told you what that is, but epidural stimulation is when you take an electrode and you put it on top of the spinal cord, and, and then you're able to, to electrically change the circuitry of your spinal cord. That's the extrinsic and intrinsic, that's the extrinsic way you can change that circuitry. When you do that, you are able to influence a very complex system. Okay? So when we think about a simple reflex in a spinal cord, it is not that simple. It's very complex. And we can influence that. And that's what came, became so powerful in our ability to change the outlook for people with paralysis. So when you think about someone who has a spinal cord injury, you disconnect them from the brain, and you think that they don't have any options unless you can regenerate that. But if you now think about this complex circuitry in the spinal cord, and now you have some access to it, you open up a lot of possibilities. Okay, so the principles for epidural stimulation are that you have this complex circuitry, and you can use the stimulator to change what's called the central state of excitability of that circuitry. So this is the principles of this, okay? You can change the central state of excitability, and then remember that proprioception that I mentioned to you, that information that comes back into the spinal cord. So that's another way that you can change that. So in relation to 
in relationship to walking or locomotion, those are things like loading, sensory cues like you have weight on your feet, where your position is uh, here. So if I'm stepping, one leg's up, one leg's down. What are the positions of my legs in space? Those kinds of cues. And so we can use that idea. Now I have this, if you, I have this sophisticated circuitry in my spinal cord. I can use a stimulator to raise what's called the central state of excitability. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later. And then I can take this proprioception, and if the spinal cord can recognize that, and if it's sophisticated, like we know that all other species <coughs> are, and I have this infrastructure, and I can drive it, then I can drive recovery, and I can do it without the brain. And we tested that because scientists had discovered that that is how locomotion occurs in all other species except for humans. Okay, so that's how locomotion occurs in all other humans. So, in the first 15 years of my career, we did experiments in people with complete spinal cord injury to see if the human circuitry might be sophisticated enough to have some of those properties. And I'm not going to talk about those experiments, but there was enough evidence where an international group got together and said, it looks like those properties might exist in humans. But for us to really be able to know, we really need to go in and really test this in the spinal cord. Okay, now at that time, what we thought was just locomotion. So locomotion, only because it's this repetitive movement, fish swim, eel swim, lamprey swim, bug scuttle, all, it's this repetitive locomotor thing that all species do. But of course, voluntary movement, complex things like moving our fingers or wiggling our toes or things we think about, that's a human thing. That's our brain. So of course, voluntary movement, not that, it's just this repetitive movement that would occur. So it's just locomotion. So our thinking was we're going to take people with complete injuries, we're going to put this stimulator in, and for proof of principle, we're going to put the stimulator in, we're going to test this, and then actually we're going to take the stimulator out. But we're going to do it because if this is true, we can rethink paralysis, and then down the road, we can think about new strategies, but it's worth it. It's worth doing this because it could rethink paralysis, how we think about paralysis and, and think about those things. Oh, it jumped ahead. Hmm. Okay. So we put a stimulator in, in the, in the lower spinal cord, and this is location, 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 because where we put this was really important. It had to be where that circuitry was. Where we put this in the spinal cord was really important. And we did this in collaboration with uh, my colleagues at UCLA. And uh, I want to point out, uh, my, my, they flashed up here. I want to uh, point this uh, neurosurgeon here, Dr. Grossman. You may have read about him in the newspaper. He is a very famous man. And he's very famous. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. But you may have read about him recently on the anniversary of President Kennedy being shot because he was the first resident who took care of him. And did you read about him? Yeah. He's the first one who took care of, well, sadly didn't take care of President Kennedy, but he was part of that. So he's a bit, wonderful man and very, very famous neurosurgeon. We got to collaborate with him on this study. Um, but what ended up, ha what was shocking about this, so our first paper, two very unexpected things happened. First of all, remember, we're supposed to be doing locomotion. Just want you to remember that because I'm not going to talk anything about it anymore. Okay? But we, when we put this individual up to get him stepping, he stood independently. And the day of this experiment, the people around me said, he's standing independently. What do we do? And I said, well, Let's lower the body weight support. 
So we lowered the body weight support, not the poor person. I think it was a student actually. I kept saying, lower the body weight support. Just lowered it. Lower the body weight support. And I'm yelling in a loud voice, lower the body. And they said, it's at zero. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh. And Claudia says, what do we do now? And I said, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> what do we do now? And so what we did is we completely changed the experiment. And this is, this is very confusing to a lot of people because usually you don't do this. But the reason we changed the experiment is because suddenly we thought this could actually be helpful to this particular individual because for two years he's not been able to stand. Suddenly he stood. And it suddenly changed our thinking as well. So we were going to just step him and see if we could get these stepping movements like all other species and see if we saw the stepping circuitry. But we decided to stand train him first. And so we did stand train him. And I'm going to tell you about those, um, those studies in a minute. But we trained him to stand. So we trained him to stand for 80 sessions. And he did stand independently, as you already see. And, and he got better. I'm going to tell you about that. But in order for us to understand the circuitry, we do these mapping experiments. And they're very boring. And they take three hours. They're very boring. We just carefully, you saw that little, uh, um, uh, all the 16 electrodes. And Samina knows about this. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about her data, because she'll present it to you, I'm sure. But it's very boring. And we do hundreds of different combinations. And so one day, and we have an advocate. Every time our, our individuals come in, they have one person who's always dedicated to them because these individuals have lots of different medical events. So we have one person, and their job is just to stay with them and make sure they're feeling OK and everything's OK with them. That's their job. And they're over there talking and whispering. And I'm kind of like, whoa, this is a very expensive experiment. Why are they over there whispering? But I'm trying to smile at the research participant, at glare at the other person, and I'm sure my face looked very distorted. And I'm looking over there, and um, and I can say this person's name is Rob because it's been all over the news. And Rob says, "Susie, look, I can move my toe." And I said, oh, no. "All right, what?" I was looking like, "Whatever." There's no look. I can move my toe now. These people can move they, involuntarily. And I said, well, OK, lay back, close your eyes, and move your right toe. Moves it. Go, move your left toe. Moves it. Right. Moves it. And I very professionally and intellectually said, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, how am I doing that? And I said, I have absolutely no idea how you're doing it. <laughs> and so this was an astonishing and unexpected finding. Now, he was a motor complete paralyzed person, but he had some sensation. He had some sensation. And so what we thought was maybe there we had driven, in all of this training, we had driven some plasticity in the stimulation, <coughs> this intense stimulation in his back. Somehow, the brain, there have been some brain plasticity, and these sensory fibers have become motor fibers. And some, so this was our hypothesis. And so we said, OK, now, and again, we changed the experiment. And we said, OK, we are going to bring in a person who now has a really, really complete injury. So no sensory, no motor. <clears throat> so we changed our experiment. And we brought this individual in. And we said, we're bringing in this individual, and, uh, um, and we're going to bring him in. And now, he, and, and now, remember, we didn't test this voluntary activity in the beginning because, of course, we knew he wasn't going to be able to move. And so what we did is we brought this person in who's called an Asia A. And we said, and so, and do lots of screening and lots of talking to these people. And so before he signed his final surgical consent, I said to him, I said, you know, you didn't ask me the most important question. He said, well, what's that? And I said, well, whether I think you're going to move voluntarily, you know, like our previous person. And he said, do you? And I said, well, I'm a scientist, so I never say any absolutes, but 
I think it's 98% chance you're not going to move. In fact, we are brought you in the study to test this hypothesis that, that the reason he moved is because he had these sensory fibers here. So this is, and he says, well, are my muscles going to get big like Rob's? And I said, well, I think there's like a 90% chance they will. He says, okay, well, I'm in then, you know, because I, 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 I'd like to have legs like that. And plus, I want to help get more information. If it helps us learn, I want to do that. So, because I am, as I tell my graduate students, write your hypotheses, do not believe in your hypotheses, it can go either way, but of course, I believed in my hypothesis, I did not even go to the experiment, because it was going to be boring. I apparently had better things to do. I did not go. And you know what happened? That first time we tried to move, we tried to move independently. That very first day, he moved independently. Moved his toes, moved his ankles, he moved his knees, his hips. And so, and I was a while ago, because I had a Blackberry then, huh? <laughs> and all of a sudden my Blackberry started, everybody started texting me at the same time, and it started, and so much that it actually started vibrating and fell on the floor, and I picked it up, and everybody's texting me, he moved, he moved, he moved. And then Claudia Angeli, who is a very brilliant young scientist, texted me and said, don't come down here, you're going to screw up the experiments. <laughs> And so what did I do? I went down there, I screwed up the experiments. And again, I was asked, how is this happening? And I had to say, I do not know <coughs> how this is happening. And in fact, in fact, this discovery is actually changing how we are understanding, one, how, how our entire nervous system is this does not fit in with our understanding of not just locomotion, but how movement in humans is controlled and executed. Uh, so now the other, so, so that's how this all started. And so this is Claudia here, and this is Enrico, right? Now, so, so Enrico focuses on standing, and so, um, let me talk a little bit about our standing, our standing results. So let so um, so we have. Uh, I'm going to talk. So we have one co. We have two cohorts now. So right now, kind of up to date, we have implanted 12 individuals, and we have three different cohorts. The first cohort is uh, two four four males. They're all motor complete. So they're. And, and A's and B's, so what A means is that there's no motor function or sensory function below the injury. So they can't feel, they can't move below the injury. B means that there's no motor function, but it's impaired sensory function below the injury. So there are, but what we clearly, all four of them, um, well, I'll get to that, but anyway, so that this is this first cohort, and what we did is we trained them to stand only for 80 sessions, and then we took a bunch of assessments, and then we trained them to step, and we took a bunch of assessments. Now, it got a little complicated because the first person showed us that he could move, and so then we also trained them to move voluntarily, but it was sort of a, a side thing in a way. They did it on their own, so they did it at home. And so then number two and number three and number four started at the very beginning. So it's not as standardized, but that was sort of out of the ongoing discovery. And then the other thing that started happening was they started noticing things. That their blood pressure was getting better and their respiration was getting better and their temperature regulation was getting better. So you might not know this, but all these things don't function in people with not brain Okay, locomotion. I studied locomotion. <laughs> not heart, not lungs, not temperature regulation. Now we have an advisory board. 
And I'm reporting these things from our advisory board, and our advisory board saying, you need to measure this and measure this and measure this and measure this and measure this. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> ah. So, but I have a wonderful team, and then we were very fortunate because we got funding from the Helmsley Foundation, who also saw these changes and the importance of it. And what's really interesting is for people with chronic spinal cord injury, none of this has really been studied. So we were able to build a team and build a cores and have experts in our faculty. We have scientific faculty and we're able to now start actually studying people because this isn't even studied. Because the thought was, you have a chronic spinal cord injury, there's nothing we can do. So there's not really studied. It's like your new normal. You're going to have a blood pressure of 80 over 60. It's a new normal. There's nothing we can do. You don't get treated. If you went in with a blood pressure of 70 over 60, they're going to put you in the hospital. If you have a spinal cord injury, you just live with it. You pass out six or seven times a day. So this then really is how our program grew and changed. So it became very complicated. But anyway, so, so, um, all right, so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about the details of what we learned about standing and about the voluntary movement. So here's the data that we collect from this. So this is EMG data. And what's pretty interesting about this, so this is left leg flexion. So what's really, so this is left leg flexion here. And what you'll see here is here's no stimulation and here's stimulation. And so here, now what is, here's the left leg. So here's the attempt. And with no stimulation, they're not able to do it. Okay, here's with stimulation, they're attempting left leg stimulation, so you'll hear. Now, what you see is it's constant stimulation. We're not doing rhythmic stimulation, we're not stimulating only when we want the, the movement, it's a constant stimulation. And what you see is the exact muscles that are needed are on, and it's normal EMG activity. It's for the movement. Okay. And so you can see this also with left toe extension, and here's constant stimulation. Okay, so what does this tell us? What does this tell us about what's happening? How, what does this tell us about? Well, so remember that term I said, central state of excitability. So what I want you to imagine, so this top-down thinking, what do we think about this? Well, the brain decides what we're going to do and sends complicated control signals down to our motor neurons, right, and then tells the spinal cord it's just a conduit of how we move, right, in voluntary movement. I believed it too. I did. I'm going to tell you. Six years ago, I believed that too. But I don't think you can explain our data like that. I mean, by every other means, they can't, there's no, we did everything, okay? We did TMS, we asked them to move, we did imaging. We did everything. There's no detection of a single a thing crossing that lesion. You look at the MRI, it looks terrible. Now, if it, there, has to be, there has to be neurons crossing the lesion because the experiments that we do, let's see, I think, um, the experiments we do, if you look here, um, So this is just without stimulation off. This is, this is with stimulation on. Let me just show you this here. You can see the stimulation. OK, so he's listening, and he's following the command, right? So the command is above the injury level, and then he's doing it, right? So something has to be crossing the lesion here. And again, you're seeing very distinct control of movement below the injury level. Okay. Now the other thing that you'll see, and this is all, this work is all uh, uh, driven by Claudia. Now the other thing here, this experiment, what you'll see here, is they are given an auditory tone, an auditory signal. And it's low, it's medium, or high. And the strength of the force of the movement needs to match the tone. Okay, so what you can see from this data 
is when it's a low tone, they do a low force. When it's a high tone, they do a high force. When it's a medium tone, they do a medium tone. So that's the evidence that their intent of this movement is processed somehow above the lesion, and that information somehow is getting below the lesion. Okay? But the detail of that movement is complicated. It's complex. Yet, if the stimulator <coughs> is off, the movement is not executed. And the movement is complex. Okay? There's some muscles are on, some muscles are off. And yet, there cannot be very many neurons that are crossing that lesion. Thus, that signal that's crossing the lesion cannot be very complex. And the stimulator is not conveying complicated, uh, coded information. It's a constant signal. So how is this working? Now the other thing is that over time, so when we start, we have to have different stimulation configurations for different movements. So if we want ankle movement, or we want toe movement, or we want the right side or the left side, we have different configurations. And then we train, and we teach. And then over time, the configurations change, and over time, we can you start using one configuration for all of those movements. And then over time, we can use less voltage maybe for those same configurations. And the configurations for voluntary movement are different than the configurations for standing. And the configurations for standing are different from self. So, and the movements get more consistent and stronger and they can do them more often with training. So when you put all those observations together and you know the literature from the last 150 years from the animals, which I will not tell you nor quiz you on, you're going to have to take my word for it, this is the now work theory interpretation. So the working theory interpretation, you have to make the assumption that if we take the observations and assume that what is in the, at least in the mammalian literature, we accept those mechanisms in the mammalian literature, and we take what we observed in the humans, that this is what, this is what we are now putting forward as the working theory. And so the working theory is that human <coughs> beings in our circuitry, our spinal circuitry, we are born with infrastructure to do certain things and that is walking and certain movements and the spinal circuitry has the ability to learn so for it let's use walking as an example so walking you have the infrastructure to walk but you still have to learn it right so we're not born and get up and walk there's a developmental phase and then we learn to walk but we also learn how to do other things like we learn how to gesture or some people learn how to dance, or do ballet, or, or play the piano, or do other things. But once you learn that task, the details of how to execute that movement are in the spinal cord. And that final decision of whether you're going to execute that movement lies within the spinal cord. So the decision lies within the spinal cord of whether you're going to execute it. And this is how the decision is made, and how the execution is made, and how the behavior is sustained. The infrastructure, the excitability of that infrastructure. So just for a minute, imagine that the neurons of the spinal cord are filling this entire room, and there's hundreds, thousands of them, and the movement is ankle. And the ankle circuitry movement is right here. And there's tens of thousands. And I used the stimulator to light this up 
not to threshold, but almost. And so all the brain really needed was just a tiny whisper to turn it on. And that's how we did it. It was just a little whisper that was needed. Because the spinal cord got that part of the infrastructure. The infrastructure was already there. The spinal, the spinal stimulator got it ready. And then we were able to do it. Now the other piece that's really important is that proprioception. So what comes in in the environment is also important to the circuitry. And that, that information from the environment also contributes to that central state of excitability. So you go back to the central state of excitability, now in this paralyzed situation, the proprioception, the spinal stimulator, and that intent from, from the person comes into the central state of excitability. And then when you train over and over again, all those things work together. Now think back to that one little neuron, and they're all connecting, and those little mechanisms in there. When you do that over and over, those things change, and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. So then over time, those mechanisms bind together, and the probability that you're able to do that gets higher and higher and higher. And that's, that's how you relearn how to do it. And that's what drives recovery. And so now, without regeneration, we can, the probability that people who are paralyzed can recover is much greater. And the thing about this is it's much greater if we use these principles even if we don't use a stimulator. Now that we understand this, if we use them with people who are paralyzed. Okay. So we learned this from these experiments. OK, now let's talk a little bit about standing. So now, if we look at our standing, <coughs> now you think about this theory. And let's see if all our observations are still coming to hold. So this is standing. So what you see here is he can stand independently. Now, I don't know if you heard this, I mean, maybe I can play it again, but what he did is he said, okay, they were holding him, and he said, okay, three, two, one, let go. And now what you see is the EMG here, he's moving back and forth, you see the EMG changing. So again, that stimulator's constant, that's putting the excitability, now it's not that pull, that's exciting. Maybe it's all four of these poles together. So it's partly that ankle, but it's all of them. That's the infrastructure that's excited, allowing him. It's the weight bearing. It's that his legs are extended. And he said three, two, one. Now he's standing. Now he's moving. And that's changing that motor output. So you see, when he moves forward and back, that changes the motor pattern. That's that proprioception coming in. OK? So again. It's fitting. It's fitting with this, this theory. OK? <clears throat> so now we start looking at, OK, this, OK, so is this right about this infrastructure and where this infrastructure is? So now let's look at where, where we're stimulating. So this is the stimulator, OK? So this is the, the electrode. And it turns out, when you look at this, for standing, the cathodes need to be at the caudal part of the stimulator in order for you to get the best standing. Okay? So that fits with it. So the circuitry for standing, in general, you need those cathodes at the most caudal part of the electrode. So we can show, let's see. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Is that going? There we go. Okay. So what you can see up at the top is 
change the configuration, you get very different motor patterns. So here, you get, here's one, it's effective, and now here's one, not effective. And do you see here where you get that, do you see there you get this rhythmic activity? Okay, <coughs> that is starting to show you locomotor-like patterns. So if we were gonna try to go for stepping, we would generate patterns that were more like locomotion. Okay. Now, what this shows is this important, the importance of the weight bearing. Okay. So, if the individual is uh, sitting, okay, if they're sitting with the stimulator on, you don't get EMG activity. It's not until you introduce the appropriate proprioception, the weight bearing, that you actually get the standing EMG activity. So when I said back earlier, that it's the integration. So these inner, so it's the inner neurons, it's the neurons that communicate to other neurons in the central nervous system. <coughs> that is part of this sophisticated smart circuitry that's able to do all these different motor behaviors. So it's excited, it's in the central state of the right excitability, it's ready to do it, but it's not going to execute that behavior until it recognizes the right proprioception. So they're sitting in the chair, their feet are on the ground, but it's not until the initiation of that weight bearing that it generates the EMG activity for standing. So that's when the decision is made and to execute the motor behavior. So that decision to execute the weight bearing is made at the level of the spinal cord. Okay? Now, this is not back to normal standing. This is not back to normal moving. There's a lot of work to be done, but this kind of gives you the idea of kind of the variability of this. So these different lines show how many sessions and how long it took uh, for individuals to gain <coughs> the ability to stand. Now, one of the things that I'll tell you is part of it was our learning curve. Part of it was our ability to find the right configurations, us learning new and new lines knowledge and I'll tell you number two did better than number one, number three did number better than number two, and number four did number better than number three. What we don't know yet, because we have small numbers, is that just something about those individuals or was that our learning knowledge and until we get more numbers we're not going to know. Uh, one of the things we, um, one of our next studies that we want to do is to actually bring everyone back with our new knowledge and things that we're doing differently to answer that question. Now, going back to the, uh, oops, the training, uh, one of the most really critical things is what we found out. So, remember, I told you they, we trained them to stand, and then we trained them for 80 sessions to step. And what ended up happening, this is the curve, so everyone could stand independently after they Train, were trained to stand. Then we trained them to step, and three of them lost their ability to stand independently. So remember the words task specificity, that proprioception, that training, that was direct evidence. Now, I will tell you the good news is we retrained them to stand again. So they could relearn to stand. It was much quicker. It was very quick. They did relearn to stand. And, and since then, now, I told you we had a second cohort. I'm not going to show you the data from them, but we had a second cohort. And now the way we train them is we train them interleavingly both to stand and to step at the same time. So in the morning, we train to stand. In the afternoon, they train to step. And they can also learn to stand. And I'm not going to talk about stepping today. You'll have to have me back later to tell you what happens to stepping. But they do better in both the tasks when you train them to do both. So the question there was, can the spinal cord learn two tasks at once? Those two tasks at once. So, 
<clears throat> okay, so the concept here, just to summarize the concept, is you need a central state of excitability. The proprioception is really critical. Supraspinal input, but without that central state of excitability, you're not going to get uh, that, that, that stuff. The motor task is um, driven by the sensory information that's related specifically to that motor task. And that's really shown specifically here. You've got no epidural stimulate, this no epidural stimulation. This the epidural stimulation is the same here, but here they're standing. This is standing EMG. Here they're stepping, and you get locomotor EMG. So that's really showing that proprioception. Okay, now I'm going to give this is kind of give you an intro to, to what we're doing now here. So this is stepping. Um, that, uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is what we're doing in uh, ongoing right, right now, and, and a, 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 a paper we're working on right now. In the second cohort, I told you we we're training them to stand and step at the same time. So that first cohort, what I'm going to tell you is none of them were able to generate independent stepping. So we changed the stepping paradigm here. And what we didn't do, again, remember, we weren't thinking about voluntary, this ability to do voluntary. That emerged over time. We weren't thinking about that. But what we found as we went along was this ability to bring intent in. And so what you see here, which is sort of a prelude to what we're doing now, is they're stepping, but then when they think about stepping, they intend to step, they can really influence that locomotor pattern. So that's what we're working on right now, is integrating that intent and the, you know, so we're integrating that into the locomotion. So that's what we're working on now. Okay? And so this is our second cohort, and we're working on that right now. And uh, one of the things that we're also finding, and is, is really advanced, and this is, you know, really for you guys, and like, who knew it would be so hard? Uh, we did, but the complexity of the considerations <coughs> that we need, uh, understanding the mapping, and, and that's what uh, we've been collaborating on with your colleagues here, and all the complexities of, of, the, of the configurations that we're doing. So, kind of in summary, the spinal networks are very sophisticated. There's a strong influence by sensory input. It requires task-specific learning, complex integration. You have to execute, the spinal cord itself executes the details of movement and the sens sensory um, uh, ex uh, uh, here, sorry, I wanted to flip through this. Oops, sorry, back here. So one of the things that's really important about this is that we take these concepts and we want to we want to translate that into uh, activity-based therapy. And so we do that by um, uh, putting them into therapeutic concepts with our colleagues over at Fraser, with the therapists and the physicians, um, and developing new therapies. Okay. Now, I just want to touch on this really quickly. Um, so, this is, these individuals, we didn't expect this, but these individuals all kept their stimulators, um, and they are with us now for life. So, the FDA, when we first gave our application, they said, well, what will you do if they keep them? And I said, I don't know, what will we do? <laughs> they said, well, you'll follow them up until it either comes a clinic, becomes a clinical, uh, comes clinically uh, approved as a clinical treatment, and so we do. So which one, watching this professional football game, completely paralyzed person, do you think? It is. Huh? The one that's this time. Yeah, it's number 24. That's him, out there. Okay, how about this one? 
Don't tell the FDA. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's this guy. So he has what we call the trunk and big. And so, he, yep, and the, the guy who, he is able to sit independently and he did not fall out of that boat. And he's able to, he was able to sit independently. So not even part of the study, it turns out that they're able, their trunk is able to state to be strong. To, their trunk, and we're trying to understand this more, and it, that has probably been the thing that has changed their life more, is their trunk stability uh, there. So, and they, when the stimulator's on, they can exercise harder and more than if they don't have their stimulator on. So, interestingly, this guy's a paraplegic, so his arms are fine from here, but he cannot do a pull-up unless the stimulator's on. Ask me why that is. I have no idea why that is. <laughs> That's on my list of things I don't understand. I do not know why that is. The other interesting thing that we are uh, studying right now is that their bowel and bladder seems to be improving. And we have studies now that temperature regulation seems to be improving. Their muscle and their bone is improving. Heart and respiration is improving. And so uh, <coughs> we are really fortunate to have a whole, a whole set of collaborators internally as well as externally working with us to start understanding those, uh, those as well. So um, I don't have time to talk about this, but I just wanted to mention to you that uh, we do have ongoing studies looking at the normalization of blood pressure with spinal cord stimulation as well. All right, so now I know this can be really annoying for a second, but I'm going to flip through these slides because I want to get to the end of the slides um, here a second. So uh, hold on just, whoops, just for a second here. Um, yeah, because I just want to kind of touch on the other things that are going on with the lab. So the other thing is that one of the things that's kind of unique about what we're doing is we're, we're getting, we're able to get into the spinal cord and get these real basic mechanisms, but when we understand them, we're able to come out and do some other types of studies knowing this knowledge. So another thing and then also build out these therapies. So I mentioned to you the neuromuscular electrical stimulation. So we're able to use new parameters with neuromuscular uh, electrical stimulation, and we're actually, we're able to design a new therapy that therapists are testing now, not only for the legs, but also for the arms. And so just, it's just, it's with new stimulation parameters, and what's key about this is although we're stimulating the muscles, we're getting back to the spinal cord to raise that central state of excitability. So that's another thing that we're able to do. Uh, we're able to do, um, and I'm not going to go through the, the science with you here on it, but what I wanted to do, I have this new program, usually, and I don't know how to, okay. So what I just wanted to show you with this is that we're able to take this concept and go straight to a clinical model. And I just wanted to show you one example of this. And this is someone who is, who is nine years post-injury. So, okay, so this is, this is what she was able to do before. Oops. Hopefully I can show you this. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, well, I think you can see it in the thing. So this is what she was able to do before, and this is what she was able to do after. The key of this, though, is that, the key of this is that she was eight years after injury. So the other thing is that this circuitry maintains this plasticity for years, and this is a new finding, too. But 
she was able to tie, oh, it was 13 years, sorry, 13 years after him. She was able to tie her shoes for the first time in 13 years. And it was because we applied this idea to the whole circuitry of the spinal cord. The idea that we could, that this movement could be executed by using this particular concept. And what she did, she was also able to write. So she wrote that these were all the new things she could do after using this new therapy based on these, these ideas. <clears throat> so, and this is again just showing you using these ideas into, in the therapy. Here. Okay. So, what I just want to end with is just to touch on the fantastic collaborations that we have. And so I do want to uh, congratulate Samina on a publication that was just published in Plus One. So congratulations, and that was a collaboration with several of uh, your uh, colleagues over here, and uh, Padia as well. And that was just in Plus One. And this has really moved us ahead in being able to uh, take the, my talk, uh, take uh, for us to be able to find config the configurations that we need for all of our different, for cardiovascular, for voluntary, for standing, and for stepping, and that has been a huge help, and we have much more work to do, though, much more work to do, so we're looking forward to that. Um, also, uh, with Dr. Behrman, and I think maybe she's been over here to speak again, um, the uh, Kermit, the, um, the, or the power, uh, is it Kermit called Kermit or Power Kids? What's it oh, called now? Kermit. Okay, so, yeah, so I have to, of course, mention that. That's almost done, almost, almost, almost done. <laughs> I have to put that final push for that. So that's been a great collaboration. This is our engineering core over uh, at the center, so I have to, uh, have to highlight that team, but also I'd like to highlight um, all the engineers over here who have helped us on this project um, actually push forward uh, several patents um, on this project, and we uh, could not uh, be where we are today without our wonderful collaboration with the Speed School. So thank you very much for uh, your patience and listening to me and letting me share a part of our story and having me over here today, and I'm glad to answer any questions.